Okay, well, thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be here to discuss a little bit of a different vantage point than we've heard so far on this panel, which is thinking a little bit more about the role of the media in creating, or, uh, creating or amplifying divisions among the public and really uh, honing in on the role of the news media in this situation, because I think that it's a really important contributor when we think about divides and fragmentation and fracturing among the public. So I'm going to focus my comments primarily on that. And I will say at the outset that really what I'm looking at here is I'll sprinkle a little bit of empirical data in here, but I think I'm, I'm more inclined to think of this as a little bit of a thought piece in terms of where is this going and what are some implications of the way in which the media are talking about politics and the way in which the media are flattening our ability to communicate with elites. So it's a lot easier for the public to communicate with elites both, to, both in the news media and in government. So I'll, I'll start with that. Um, so I've been uh, primarily concerned for many years now with the experience of selective exposure whereby people are more likely to look at information matching their beliefs than they are information that might contradict their beliefs. And it's an interesting field of inquiry because it's a, a hotly contested one, despite the fact that I personally feel like I see this all the time. There are people that think that this is happening quite frequently and that we're uh, eventually going to end up in these echo chambers where all we're seeing is information that agrees with us. And there are others that believe that this is in fact not the case whatsoever, that echo chambers are a mythical concept that we should dismiss with, that we should dismiss altogether. So what I want to start with is really thinking about what we know about partisan selective exposure. And to begin with, I'm going to make a definitional move, which is there are lots of ways to define selective exposure. I'm going to define it as the probability of selecting like-minded content being greater than the probability of selecting counter-attitudinal content. And I'm doing this quite strategically because some would define partisan selective exposure as only or exclusively looking at like-minded content, which I think is a a huge definitional misstep because it means that this concept essentially never happens because very few people only look at one side. So I'm going to focus on this as the definition. And we know quite a few things uh, about partisan selective exposure. So first, we know it takes place in a variety of different circumstances. We have demonstrations that it happens across different types of media. So whether you're looking online at social media or you're looking at old school newspapers, uh, you see these patterns of people selecting information that matches whatever they happen to believe at a greater degree than they do information that might disconfirm their beliefs. And I think that this is a really democratically consequential thing and one that's quite important to our convening today because of the consequences of people's partisan selective exposure habits. And my own research and several others, I think, has shown quite conclusively that when you're looking at information that matches what you believe, uh, it tends to increase your level of political polarization. So you're might more likely to feel quite passionately about your own perspective and believe that the other perspective is quite wrong. Uh, you'll rate things on favorability thermometers that agree with you much more highly and those uh, that are against you much less highly. And people who are engaging in this sort of behavior are far more likely to participate in politics. There's something quite energizing about uh, looking at media that match your beliefs that make people think, oh, I should go get involved and somehow participate in one way or another. So I, I'm, uh, I, I note that this is maybe uh, controversial to uh, uh, some, but I would contend that we do know that partisan selective exposure is related to these concepts. But then the third one is the really important one, and one that I'm going to hone in on a little bit more, is that partisan selective exposure does not always occur, and it's not the case that this is an echo chamber concept. And this is where I'm getting back into where I go with the definition. So we know that people don't exclusively look at information that matches what they believe. They venture out. They look at information from the other side. They often go to mainstream news sources, and I'll put it in quotation marks up here, knowing that uh, if we all tried in this room to define mainstream news sources, we would struggle with that definition. But if we tentatively say that it's those media organizations that are trying to present information on both sides of the aisle, and are doing so in a way that they're attempting not to have a partisan skew, people are still going to those. So this happens if you look at Nielsen ratings, even though people are turning to MSNBC and Fox News, they're still tuning in to NBC Nightly News or to a CNN potentially. Again, all of these would involve a definitional debate, I grant. Um, you see the same thing if you look at web tracking data. So people who are going to quite extreme websites on one side or the other are still going to mainstream websites in the middle. So there's something here about partisan selective exposure that isn't absolute, and I find this to be a, a potential place of democratic possibility, because this means that people aren't so walled off 
that they can never be reached. They're still looking at some sources that have the potential to reach individuals across the political spectrum. So I think that this then gets me to my next point is what don't we know? And I think we actually don't know a lot about what happens when people are exposed to non-like-minded things. And if you read through this literature, there's actually a lot of controversy over what happens when you're looking at non-like-minded. And I'm using this term strategically as well because I'm thinking here of non-like-minded. It could be the diehard Democrat watching Fox News, or it could be the diehard Republican that's going to a more mainstream news outlet. So I'm conflating these two, which we should and could separate. Um, but when we've looked at exposure beyond like-minded, we find that A, sometimes it's related to polarization. So people look at information that disagrees with them and become more fervent believers in their political perspective. So they're boomeranging against that didn't tend to the message. And there's been quite a few particularly experimental studies that have demonstrated this occurrence. But it's also true that in the literature, this does not always occur. There are moments where you can intersect with information that doesn't agree with you. And sometimes it's related to moderation or potentially persuasion, where people's attitudes are changing or their feelings of comfort toward a view unlike their own, are, are whether, where their views are becoming, where they're more comfortable with those sorts of views. So I think that this is actually a really interesting place to play and think more about what's happening here because it's not clear cut. There's obviously many other things going on that affect whether or not we depolarize or polarize as a consequence of exposure to views that we disagree with. So my big question uh, is when does exposure to non-like-minded media polarize and when does it not? And I think that one possible solution to this or one component that we need to dive into more is thinking about this more broadly. So most studies that are done, particularly experimental studies, are just showing people, here's the non-like-minded media, now answer these questions afterward. And that's not what really happens in the real world, right? People bounce from one media outlet to another. They might look at like-minded news and then go to mainstream news outlets. And so I think to more comprehensively understand this, we need to be creating contexts that allow for people's diverse exposures within the experiment. So let's look at like-minded, and then let's also expose people to mainstream and find out how that plays out. So I've been really interested in thinking about this through the lens of inoculation theory, which is the idea that perhaps what's happening here and the big effect that partisan media are having is that they inoculate you against views for the other side. So you listen to some like-minded media and it prepares you with arguments against the other side. So if you encounter it at a future moment, you're really well equipped to say, no, that's wrong, that's a lie, I don't believe that. And so I think that this is a really powerful uh, theory to apply to partisan media. And my contention is that partisan media may provide arguments that shield audiences from the contradictory information that they may obtain from other sources. And so this is an argument that even though some might say, oh look, selective exposure or echo chambers aren't really happening because look at all the evidence that people go to the other side. I'm saying, okay, maybe, but if they're going to the other side really well equipped and inoculated against those arguments, should we really be celebrating this as a democratic victory that the Fox News viewer tuned in to NewYorkTimes.com or something like that? So I'm gonna share just a little bit of an experiment that we did looking at this. Um, this is with my graduate student, Alex Curry. Um, we randomly assigned people to different conditions. Some received a control condition where they didn't see any information, or it, it, where they didn't see any information. Some looked at a like-minded news condition. So we uh, assigned Republicans to see Fox News, Democrats to see MSNBC. We had a mainstream news condition, which was NBC News. And then we had two mixed conditions where we showed people a like-minded, then mainstream news clip, or vice versa. And we looked at these two patterns because even in the historical inoculation theory literature, it's not clear whether you need to be inoculated before or after, uh, which is kind of funny because the name inoculation almost applies. You're inoculated first and then you're okay afterward. But the research literature suggests that it's possible you could be inoculated afterward, essentially, and still counter-argue the arguments that you've encountered. So um, I'm not gonna get into a ton of the specifics on this, but I wanna share some of the findings from this. And the first is after they watched the broadcast, we just asked them literally what did the broadcast say? So could they agree on the basic facts of what the broadcast said after they were exposed to the exact broadcast that they watched? Encouragingly, uh, they can. Uh, so in the particular uh, case that we're looking at here, it was looking at the Keystone Pipeline and uh, in this particular NBC broadcast, it was after a report was released suggesting that it would have very little environmental impact. NBC picked this up. Democrats and Republicans agree on that. The clip also mentioned that it would create jobs. 
Uh, it did mention that it won't affect crude oil demand, but it was kind of tucked in the middle, so only about half of people recalled this. It did not actually mention producing more, or more pollution, although nearly 30% of Democrats and Republicans recalled it saying that, so you get a little bit of a mixed picture. But in general here, you see that Democrats and Republicans come away with a similar factual understanding of what is happening in this report. Now, we took actual news reports, so we were showing people real clips. And when we did this for the like-minded news condition, and afterward we asked them about what the content of this report was based on the reporting that they had just read, here's where we start to see really dramatic partisan differences. So when we asked whether or not, according to the news media that they watched, this report concluded that there was little uh, environmental impact. Republicans believe that there is, in fact, very little environmental impact. And uh, Democrats came away with, from their clip on MSNBC believing that the conclusion of the report was that it produces more, or produces more pollution. So you start to get these dramatically different understanding of a factual document that was then reported on in different outlets in very different ways, leading people to very different conclusions. So this is just the facts. Did they understand what was being said in that media outlet? But then we want to look how did this translate then into their beliefs or into their attitudes afterward. And so if we look at the resulting beliefs, and now we're looking across the conditions, uh, this is what happens when we look at what people saw. So in our control condition, as we would expect, this is the percentage of people saying that the Keystone Pipeline would pose a significant risk to the environment. We see the expected uh, divide, the partisan divide. Democrats think it's more likely to have an environmental impact than do Republicans. But then if you look across the conditions, what you find is that for mainstream news, it looks actually approximately similar. But as soon as you introduce any like-minded news coverage to this, whether, it's, uh, it, whether the mainstream is added or not, you start to amplify this partisan divide where Democrats then are quite likely to say it would pose a significant risk to the environment and Republicans far less so. And there's really not a statistical difference across the like-minded mainstream combinations and like-minded. So there seems to be something going on when you introduce like-minded to the mix, whether before or after, or don't introduce mainstream at all, that changes the way that partisans are, are believing the world to be with respect to this pipeline. Similar sort of thing here, uh, when we look at the percent uh, who believe that the Keystone Pipeline would create a, a lot of jobs, uh, this one is a more Republican-leaning argument, and in the control condition, Republicans are more likely to endorse this belief than are Democrats. But if we look across, again, as soon as we start to see any combination of like-minded, whether it's by itself or with mainstream included, we see an enhanced polarization between Democrats and Republicans. Um, going on to attitudes, so we have the factual information, beliefs, and then continuing on to attitudes, it's a little bit less clear. This is a more distal sort of change, and people would have more hardened attitudes, so it's a little bit uh, of a tougher test. Nonetheless, even here, you see the control condition has a lot less polarization. There's not so much a gap between our two bars. And all of the others are increasing the gap between the two. We find significant uh, differences based on partisanship in the like-minded and like-minded mainstream combinations. So from this just brief discussion, I think the takeaways are that like-minded sources polarize. But we shouldn't say, oh, great, well, people are going mainstream news, everything's fine, we're going to be okay. Because, in fact, mainstream news plus like-minded news isn't very different from like-minded news by itself. And I suggest that inoculation theory is perhaps one way that we can understand why this is happening, because the like-minded news prepares you for encountering information that might be different, whether it's in mainstream or counter-attitudinal news. Now, all sorts of limitations on this. This is a single case. The inoculation in these clips was not terribly overt, so it wasn't as though they said, the other side is going to tell you this, but that is wrong. And that happens. So I think that these patterns potentially are even more extreme, but I don't know. We need to do more research on that. So I really welcome your thoughts as we continue to think on how to do this. Um, and now I want to pull this a little bit further, and this is definitely going beyond what we've studied to this point, which is in spaces where audiences can interact with the news media or elites, I don't think, if, let me start again. I don't think that this is a phenomenon that happens so passively, because so far it's pretty passive, right? It's people going to the media, the media messages are then affecting them, but they're not really doing anything. And I want to argue that similar sorts of patterns are happening in more active spaces, where audiences have a role and a way to get involved. And so there are now all sorts of spaces where audiences can interact with news media and elites and be more active in, in these occasions where this happens. And I think that we have some evidence here that contentious politics garners more attention. 
Um, so I did some research with a former graduate student, Ashley Muniman, on this, and we were looking at, uh, from the New York Times comment stream, it was about 10 million different comments trying to find out what is it that yields the highest number of recommendations on these comments, and it was comments that included partisan terms and uncivil terms. So people are creating this environment where partisanship and saying they're wrong, you lie, is an okay and rewarded sort of behavior, and I would argue eked on by a media environment that inoculates people to claims, from, uh, uh, to claims of the other side. And then here's my, where I'm really, uh, I don't have data, so I don't have data. Um, but I'm, I'm gonna propose you. Maybe um, discounting opposing views or inoculation which is something that we see so many news outlets doing, uh, particularly when it's counter-attitudinal. But maybe what we're seeing is that it's training people on how to do this. So that when you see a report on Fox News or MSNBC and then you go to a more mainstream outlet and it looks a little bit different, they're basically teaching you to question the claims of authority and to discount an opposing view. And they're saying this is how you do it. And it's totally socially acceptable to do so. So you can think about this in any context where a partisan media outlet has on two sides and one is far better represented than the other. And they're questioning the claims of the other side, even when it's someone that has quite credentialed. So a very well-known scientist opposite a host on a, 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 talk, radio, a talk radio show even. Um, so I think that this is what's happening. And then the final uh, component here that I just keep thinking about when I think about this topic is are we really training and privileging experience over expertise by doing all of this? Because on any news program, the host is making claims about the Keystone Pipeline report that was really carefully conducted by leading scientists. And then they're just spinning it in all these different directions, <coughs> saying that, oh, it's my experience of this report, not really the expertise of the scientists that created it. And so to me, I think this is really a key phrase for us to think about as we uh, ponder all of the excellent themes that we've heard so far and will continue to do so. So thank you so much.